Thank you for joining us for a executive session series with Lori White featuring Dr. Ashish Jha from Brown University. He is the Dean of the School of Public Health, Professor of Health Services, Policy, and Practice. We'll be starting in just over a minute. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Please share, please like, please comment. Let us know where you're watching from. Lori White will be interviewing Dr. Ashish Jha from Brown University. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to episode number 78 of Chamber TV. My name is Lori White, and I'm the president of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. And I'm joined today by my co-host, Sri Srinivasan, founder and CEO of Digger Mentors, and the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor at Stony Brook University. Welcome, Sri. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. We are also joined by a very special guest, Dr. Ashish Jha. He is a practicing physician. He is a health policy researcher, and he is the third dean of the Brown University School of Public Health. Or as he notes in his Twitter bio, he is a physician, a researcher, and an advocate for the notion that an ounce of data is worth a thousand pounds of opinion. Dr. Jha is recognized globally as an expert on pandemics, and he has been leading the national and international response on COVID-19. Good afternoon, Dr. Jha, and welcome to Chamber TV. And just as importantly, welcome to Rhode Island. Hello, thank you so much for having me on here, and, and I'm super excited to be in Providence and in Rhode Island. Fantastic. So you are the third dean of the School of Public Health at Brown University, and you come to Providence from your most recent assignment at Harvard University, doing uh, a similar role in public health and pandemics. Tell us a little bit about the opportunity that's in front of you here in Providence. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. And again, thanks for having me on. And let's talk a little bit about why I'm really excited to be in the role I am in right now. Um, one of the things that this pandemic has certainly taught us is that the effects of public health and, and when public health doesn't work are felt across every aspect of our society, in education, in business, in, in every part of our lives, uh, we see its effects. And this is something that I've been thinking about for some time and thinking that if we are really going to be effective in public health, we have to be truly multidisciplinary, that it can't just be the epidemiologists or the physicians or the economists, uh, that we have to be working with people across sectors. And that is actually one thing, I mean, there are many things that Brown does very well, but that is one thing Brown does particularly well and unusually well. And so part of what got me excited about coming, and this was all happening before the pandemic really took off, um, was the idea of working at a public health school and building up a public health school uh, that worked across sectors, across disciplines. Uh, so that is, I think, for me, the biggest attraction of being here. And I think we have a very, very good public health school, and I think it can become an even greater public health school, uh, especially if it engages with the broader Providence and Rhode Island community. In your work and in your recruitment of students, um, no doubt there is a massive hunger for public health education and 
the challenge before you is to think hard about how to create new opportunities to engage students and also how to engage the global universe, if you will, on this topic. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, what is really clear to me is that it's not going to be a one size fits all. I mean, we may get more students who want to come get a master's. We may get more students who want to come get a doctoral degree. Um, but almost everybody in the world wants to understand public health better. And so there are opportunities here for serving that global hunger for basic public health education. Most people are not going to leave their jobs, leave their lives, come to Providence and spend a year or two or four and get a degree. I think that model, while very important, can't be the only way we educate people. So we've already started doing a lot of work and a lot of thinking about how do we educate businesses to understand what just happened, what is happening, uh, and how to get through the rest of this pandemic and how to prepare for the next one. How do we educate uh, regular people, teachers, and uh, and and you know healthcare workers, and all these folks who want to understand the basics of public health? So I think we're going to be inventing new educational models. We're going to be inventing and, and working on new educational platforms. Uh, the idea that everybody has to come to Providence to get education in public health uh, can't be right. It's got to be. We've got to be felt around the world, and I'm really focused on trying to make that happen sooner rather than later. Uh, so we can begin to meet that need. Thank you for that. Um, let's get right to the news of the day. And today, Pfizer said it could be ready to apply for emergency use of its COVID-19 vaccine by late November, assuming it receives positive efficacy and safety data um, as a result of its late stage human trials. So this would be the first time, Dr. Jha, that um, any Western vaccine developer has provided such a specific timeline. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. Um, lots of people have been thinking about when when a new vaccine, when the emergency use authorization would come through. But this is the first time I've heard from a company, uh, a timeline that also makes sense to me. I think uh, when I look at the Pfizer release, I think, yeah, that sounds about right. Again, fingers crossed, assuming everything goes well. What, uh, what will you be looking for as this um, emergency use declaration begins to um, build momentum? Yeah. So actually, FDA has actually laid out, I think, very good criteria for how to assess whether a vaccine is ready for emergency use authorization. And I, I won't get into all the details to give you the high level. Two things. One is the average person in, in the clinical trial should have been followed for at least two months with the idea that in two months, we're going to see all of the short term negative side effects. Uh, they, those should emerge within 60 days. And I think that's a good metric. We probably don't have the luxury of waiting for long term follow up. We will need that long term follow up. But that 60 days feels like a minimum. The second, of course, we want to show that it's actually working, that it's preventing infections, ideally preventing severe infections, because that's what we care about most. Um, my best guess is that if everything goes well, we will see that in the Pfizer data. We may see it in, in other vaccine uh, products by late November, December as well. Uh, there are four that are in very late stage trials. And my hope is uh, two, three or four of those get through that set of gates uh, as we head into December and, and finish up the end of the year. So certainly we'll be watching how those trials um, again progress um, as the days and months um, continue. And to um, to really amplify on this discussion, I'd like to turn it over to uh, my co-host, uh, Sri Srinivasan, who has been thinking about this topic for a long time and uh, has uh, led a, a number of um, global discussions on vaccine development and the actual about the world. So turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I've spoken to more than 100 doctors, but you bring that great insight, Dr. Cha, whenever we see you on CNN. Can you give us a state of the union in terms of where we are with the, with the pandemic right now? What are we, where are we right now and what do we need to be watching for, especially as we continue into the fall and looking at the elections and beyond? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy to, uh, though, you, what I will bring is maybe not such good news. Uh, the last four, six weeks, we have seen a real turn in our country in terms of number of infections uh, starting to head up. And we are up about 40% from where we were, 35% uh, from where we were about a month ago. Uh, it's a pretty sizable increase in, in a month. And so we're at doing about 50,000 cases a day right now in terms of new infections that we're identifying. And if current trends hold, we're going to be at 
60, 70,000 in the next uh, three to four weeks. That's a lot of cases. Um, in uh, 44 states, hospitalizations are going up. And uh, unfortunately, we've played this mo movie out before. Cases rise, then hospitalizations rise, then deaths increase. So we have got to be very, very careful as we head into the fall. Uh, there's a set of things we can do to keep that uh, these infections from really getting out of control. Uh, the way to think about this, the mental image that I've always had in my mind that has helped me understand this, is infection spread in the communities like a freight train. And it, when it gets going, it's very slow and you can sort of see it moving, but it doesn't feel like things are really heading. Once it gathers speed, it has a ton of momentum and stopping it requires incredible amount of energy. I mean, we saw that in Rhode Island in April, May, you essentially have to shut the state down for a long period of time to shut off the infections. The key here is to not let the infection get that kind of momentum. And I'm worried that we are not paying enough attention. So that is happening across the country. What I've been saying is we have a very, I think we have a tough three, four months ahead, which we can manage if we, if we are smart. I do believe that by, January, probably more February, we'll start seeing more vaccinations happening. By March or April, we'll start seeing large numbers of people getting vaccinated. That will have a very substantial dampening effect on infections in the community. And it will really start bringing things to a newer normal. We're not going to be out of the woods completely, but life will be dramatically better, I believe, certainly by May or June. Uh, but things will start getting better by, by March, April, if the timelines hold. We've got to figure out how to be smart between now and March. Thank you. I would also ask you to just comment on the idea that maybe healthy adults or younger healthy adults may not get the vaccine till well closer to 2022. Yeah, it's a really interesting question about timelines of what will happen and how is this going to play out. So we're still waiting for the White House to give us uh, the plan for vaccine, um, essentially order of who's going to get vaccinated when. And, uh, but here's what I think is likely to happen. Likely to happen first round healthcare workers, first responders, right? Makes total sense. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of those folks start getting vaccinated in December or early January. Um, the next round will be the vulnerable older people, people with chronic diseases. And that's the group I expect to get vaccinated let's say mid-Jan, and this is all very optimistic, like everything's got to go really well here, mid-January through March, April. Um, by that time, my hope is we're going to have uh, tens of millions, ideally hundreds of millions of doses. And if things go very well, Sri, and again, <laughs> not, not everything has gone so well in this pandemic, so uh, fingers crossed, but if things go really well, younger, healthier people, late spring into summer, uh, will be. So it might be 2022, as you say. My hope is it's sooner than that. Uh, but a lot of things have to go well between now and then for my optimistic scenario to come through. Thank you. Let's go back to Laurie for another set of questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sri. Um, Dr. Jha, one of the, um, the terms that we have been hearing a lot about lately uh, include the need or the call for herd immunity while protecting the vulnerable. And you said the other day on Twitter, that's junk science and like junk food, it tastes great, but it has zero nutritional value. Tell us a little bit uh, what you mean by that, to unpack that notion of uh, herd immunity and why it's uh, junk science. Yeah, you know, and, and let me um, start off by saying, uh, I try to be, I, I, you know, I try to be uh, blunt and be clear because I think, especially on issues that I think are very dangerous and would cause a lot of harm. Uh, let me explain why I use junk science, because like junk food, and, and look, we all have had junk food in our lives and uh, at times, and it does taste good. And so in the same way, the, the call for herd immunity sounds right. It sounds like kind of, you know, as Dr. Fauci said, it sounds like we're talking about mom and apple pie, right? Protect the vulnerable, let every other everybody else get infected, build up population level immunity, and it'll make life a lot easier and we can get to herd immunity. But let's think through how that out would actually happen. So first, you have to define who's vulnerable. Well, we know some people who are older, so over 60. Um, but we also know people with chronic diseases, people who are overweight, high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Once you add all of that up, you're probably talking about 40 to 50% of all adults. 
well, 40 to 50% of all adults is a pretty high proportion of people uh, in order to sort of figure out how to protect them. The second issue, so is that the people who are not vulnerable, the young, the healthy, we don't know that they all are going to get infected and do just fine. Most of them will, but some of them might still get sick. But here's the real kicker of why this doesn't work, which is we don't know how to separate out half of the adult population from the other half. And what we have seen over and over again is infections often start in young people, people in their 20s, they're out socializing, going out to bars, going out. And then they go home, see their parents, their grandparents, and people, and the infection spreads to the vulnerable. The vulnerable, even people who live in nursing homes, doctors, nurses, nursing home workers, they don't live in the nursing home. They live in the community. And one of them might go out, get infected because there's large numbers of infections happening in the community, and they will bring that into the nursing home, asymptomatic spread, and you're going to see large outbreaks. The single biggest predictor of nursing home outbreaks is an amount of infection in the community. So we don't know how to separate people in a way that could possibly make any sense. Last point, we don't know how long immunity lasts. So this herd immunity idea is built on the notion that everybody's gonna be immune for a long period of time. We know that for most people it lasts at least three months, maybe six. And my best guess based on other coronaviruses is it might last nine or 12 months. But nine or 12 months isn't enough to get us to herd immunity because we can't get everybody infected fast enough. And so herd immunity sounds right, but once you start thinking about how do we actually pull this off, you realize mm -hmm. it won't work. Hundreds of thousands of Americans will die and we don't really know how to do this. So that's why I call it junk science. There isn't actually any serious public health person who thinks this could possibly be done. There isn't a country that's managed to pull it off. And so lots of countries have thought about it, but it just, it can't be done without having lots of people die and it still probably won't work. Is it um, your view that we are going to need and ultimately we'll see multiple vaccines being developed? Yeah, I, I often bring up to people that there are, you know, 7 billion people in the world. Uh, we're going to probably end up needing to vaccinate 5 to 6 billion of them. And then not everybody will get a vaccine uh, or want one. Uh, most of these vaccines look like they need two doses. The Pfizer one looks like it might need just one, but the others all look like they need two doses. So if you do the math, we're talking about 10 to 12 billion doses of these vaccines. That is an unprecedented thing. We don't have anywhere near the capacity to build that kind of thing, not in the US, not in Europe. So what we're gonna want, and I would not be surprised if we were here for a year from now, I would not be surprised if there are 20 vaccines out in the marketplace. Um, three or four from China, a couple from Russia, a bunch of Europeans, a bunch of Americans, uh, a bunch of Indians. Uh, and what you have is lots of different vaccinations happening across the world. Uh, the first generation of vaccines we've talked about a little bit, I think are gonna be good. They're not gonna be great. If they give us 70 or 80% protection, I think that'll be really helpful. They're not gonna have 95% protection. I'd be very surprised. I'd love to be wrong. But second or third generation vaccines that might come out in a year might. So. My take is bring all comers, all vaccine makers. As long as the vaccine is helpful, as long as it's safe, uh, I want them all in. Sri, uh, back to you to continue this. Uh, thank you. Uh, just talking about the vaccine, Doc, one of the problems that we know we have in this country are people who are very skeptical of vaccines in general. And now we have people who might have otherwise taken a vaccine, but are worried about the accelerated timeline and the politics involved in that. So can you talk to both groups of people in case some of them are watching? We know some people are watching who are skeptical for science reasons and some for political reasons. Yeah, yeah, this is this is a really important issue and it's a complicated issue. And as you point out in your question tree, there isn't a monolithic group of people that we need to address. Uh, people come at this with hesitancy about the vaccine from a variety of different perspectives. And my approach is, and my thinking about this, is we have to be open-minded. We have to be sympathetic to people who are, who are skeptical. There, and again, this is you know one of the criticisms I have of my own friends and colleagues in public health, is sometimes we look at vaccine skeptics and say, oh, those people are not very smart, or they're just anti-science. I think that's wrong. I think that's the wrong way to think about it. The, uh, those people are often very, very smart. Uh, they understand science. Uh, we have to meet them where they are. So let's talk about the vaccine hesitancy with this specific vaccine. One of the things that I have been saying for months now is it is not helpful to politicize the timeline on this. 
Uh, actually, I've talked to several of the CEOs of some of these companies and have told them that they have got a, they've got a responsibility to not talk about the vaccine in terms of timelines around the election, but talk about the vaccine in terms of timelines around the science. I will say a few things about the vaccine development process so far. The vaccine development process so far in the United States and in, in Europe uh, has been done with incredible scientific integrity. It has been done incredibly well. I know it feels like we're rushing. Operation Warp Speed is not my favorite name, but the bottom line is that the science underlying this has been terrific. And such that if it continues to be terrific, I will feel comfortable getting vaccinated. I will feel comfortable having my kids vaccinated. I'll feel comfortable having my elderly parents vaccinated. Where things have really started going off the rails in the last month or six weeks is without getting overly political about this is where the president started saying we're gonna have a vaccine by that special day i want a vaccine before the election that's not helpful because the moment you turn it into a political timeline people start getting very very anxious about whoa what are you cutting what corners are you cutting in order to meet the election deadline and my standard has been follow the science follow the fda guidance if it comes before the election great if it comes after the election great let's get the science right I think if we get the science right, I do think some of those skeptics will come back on board. I think other people, we have to figure out what is what is really holding them back, what are their concerns, and try to meet it as much as possible. There will be a small proportion we will never convince, and that's okay. And even those people deserve, I think, sympathy. Uh, but we have to listen to people. We have to understand what their concerns are. And then I think we have to engage with community leaders. This is not a place where I stand up on CNN and say, this vaccine is safe and everybody's gonna go out and get it. That's not the way the world works. So people like me and but political leaders have to engage with community leaders, religious and faith, other faith leaders, uh, talk and explain what's going on. And I think if we do all of that, we have a pretty good chance of getting a vast majority of people to get vaccinated once we have a vaccine that's safe and effective. And if we don't have that, we can't meet that criteria, then people shouldn't get vaccinated. But I, I'm actually very confident that we will have vaccines that are safe and effective. Dr. John, already feeling better after listening to you and your optimism is uh, making me feel better. What do you say to folks who uh, still are worried about whether there'll be politics, especially if there is a transition, uh, all of that? Where, who are we paying attention to? Who are the leaders that we need to say, okay, we trust them 100%? Yeah. I don't know if you should trust any single person 100%. You should trust the, the, the scientific process and the people engaged in them. And what you'll find is if stuff is starting to go wrong, if people are starting to cut corners, you can see a lot of people peeling off, a lot of people saying, whoa, I'm not comfortable with this. But the key people I look at and look to, I, I know one of them will be obvious, but I'll say it, Tony Fauci. And, and Tony Fauci has become very popular and well-known now, but I've known Tony for 20 years and have admired him for 20 years, actually 21 years. I met him in 1999. He is somebody who has been done extraordinary work on vaccines and immunolo immunology. And, and, and so he really understands these issues. And I will listen to his words, not just simply, is it a good or is it a go or no go, but how does he think about these vaccines? And I've been paying very close attention when he talks about the science. Peter Marks is the, is the most senior scientist at the FDA, who's not a political appointee. And Dr. Marx has been somebody who has immense respect in the scientific community. He's the kind of guy who, if he says, I, I don't like this, I don't like where this is going, I'm going to really look very, very hard at what's happening. So there's a bunch of people that all of us know in the community, uh, not because they're our friends, but because we, these are people that we have watched over the years act with integrity, and we expect are going to act with integrity again. And if all of them are uh, come around with to a similar set of views, I think you're going to see a lot of people uh, backing it. And if they're concerned, uh, it's going to raise my own level of concern. Thank you, folks. You're watching this amazing conversation with the great Dr. Ashish Keja of Brown School of Public Health. Please tag and share this with your friends. Even if they can't watch this live, they can watch this later. And please also send, send in your questions and comments. We can ask them of Dr. Ja, we have a little bit of time with him and we're very grateful to him for being here. Let's go to Laurie with the next set of questions. Thank you, Sri. Uh, Dr. Ja, you mentioned um, the president's um, coping with the disease. So I'm wondering what concerns you have, if any, uh, among the views of the public when they see the president ostensibly going into Walter Reed 
um, getting experimental drugs, if you will, and then emerging on the other side, uh, seemingly cured. What does that do to the overall public psyche? Yeah, there are a couple of important points that you raised there, uh, Lori, and let me let me take them on. I mean, first of all, uh, I think for a nation, it is a, it is a bit traumatic, uh, uh, traumatic and dramatic, I suppose, uh, to see a president get sick. Uh, we haven't seen that, thankfully, very often, and I think it was a very difficult moment for the nation, certainly in those first few days, uh, where he uh, where it wasn't clear what was happening with him. Um, thankfully, he has recovered, and at this point, uh, I think he is largely out of the woods. Uh, and at this point, I think he's no longer infectious. And that combination of factors, I think, gives all of us uh, a, a sense of relief. Um, because whatever your politics might be, the truth is, uh, both as a as a for a human reasons and for all the other reasons, uh, we want we want Donald Trump, we want President Trump to to get through this well. And I'm thankful that he has. Um, on the issue of, of watching the kind of therapies he's gotten, he's gotten a very unusual cocktail of therapies. The three treatments he got, the Regeneron uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, that are experimental, the Remdesivir and the Dexamethasone. I don't know any other human being in the world who's gotten that exact combination. But it's okay, he's the president, and, and you're not surprising that he gets some things a little differently. The Regeneron antibodies, I think, were probably the thing that helped him the most. Uh, remdesivir is very common treatment right now, and, and many, many Americans get this. Dexamethasone, also very common treatment, uh, really reserved for super sick people in advanced disease. It's actually a very cheap and easy to, drug to make. It's just that we think that's the group that benefits. So I think a lot of us were a little surprised that the president got the steroids early in his disease course. That's not what the clinical data suggests he should be doing. But look, I'm not going to second guess. He's a lot of very good doctors. They looked at his records. I did not. So a little puzzling, some of his therapies, but at the end of the day, uh, I trust his doctors who have done this right. So as a practicing physician and certainly an advisor nationally and internationally, you have a, a special perspective on what it might mean to be physician to the president. Do you have any insights on what Dr. Sean Conley may have been grappling with? Yeah, Dr. Conley, obviously, um, has a tough job and he has a tough job because he's got uh, the president as a patient, but he also has a nation to serve. And that's a difficult combination. Uh, I mean, I think about, you know, for myself when I'm practicing and if, a, you know, like it's pretty clear if a patient says, I don't want you to tell anybody X, Y, or Z, I don't tell anybody unless I'm somehow required by law, which is very rare. Um, you know, with Dr. Connolly, he's got to meet that physician-patient relationship. But also, this is the president, and the public has a right to know a lot of things. I have to say, I've been pretty critical of Dr. Connolly, and I want to explain why. Um, I, I think he's a perfectly good physician. I have no reason to doubt his clinical skills. Um, but I think the way he communicated was pretty consistently pretty evasive, uh, meandering and just not straightforward. If there are things you do not want to share because the patient has asked you not to share or you choose not to share, I think it would have been much better for him to say, I am not sharing this information. But the way he would do things, like you literally had to kind of decipher what he was saying. And the problem with that convoluted evasiveness is it creates a space for a whole lot of speculation, uh, a lot of conspiracy theories, a lot of like, oh, maybe the president never had the infection. Oh, maybe. And I'm like, just please be straightforward and tell us what you don't want to tell us. You can tell us, I'm not going to talk about his last test. I'm not going to talk about it. And just be upfront about it. I, I think Dr. Connolly tried too hard to thread a needle and mostly, I think, left people confused and, and frustrated. Uh, I, and I understand that he was in a difficult situation, but I think he could have handled that better. Mm -hmm. Do you think the president left against medical advice? Well, it's a little funny, you know, because the president went home to the White House, but the White House has like more hospital-like capabilities than, than many hospitals in America. Uh, and has 24 hours a day, physician, nurses, they have lots of ability to do infusions. So, you know, again, I don't know his detailed care. Should he have stayed at Walter Reed longer? I don't know. He certainly wouldn't have been sent home to the kind of home you and I live in where we don't have 24-7 hospital services available. Uh, but the White House does. And so therefore, it makes total sense to me that they would have a different threshold uh, for sending him back there. 
industry. Do our viewers uh, have anything particular on their mind that they'd like to uh, query Dr. Jha on? Sure, there are actually lots of questions coming in, so we encourage them to please keep sending the questions and we'll bring in their questions now. First, we'll start with a comment. At Spin It Social says, so thankful always to hear Dr. Jha's insight. I asked earlier, who should he listen to? Spin It Social says, I say, let's listen to Dr. Jha. So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, let's, go, <laughs> let's go with uh, a, a question here. Uh, do you believe that all the vaccines will be equally effective or some will be better for a specific patient profile? It's a question from Janet. Yeah, Janet, it's a very good question. Uh, short answer, of course, we don't know yet, but I think the underlying theme behind your question is, is really smart and is right. I suspect we're gonna see differences in efficacy across the vaccines. Uh, I think we're gonna see differences in efficacy by potentially by populations. Uh, what is actually even more likely, almost surely to be true, is some vaccines will not have even been tried in certain populations. So some vaccines are now starting to get tested in older children uh, but other vaccines are not. And so we'll have lots of questions about which vaccine to use in kids. But ones that have been tested in kids will obviously be something that we'll feel much more comfortable about. So I do see a segmentation coming with different vaccines for different people, depending on their risk profile, uh, whether it's been tested in them and what the data says about the efficacy and safety for that population. We have a question from Katie here. How does the CDC or anyone else decide who gets the vaccine in each state? Is it state by state? Is it? Can you walk us through that? Because there's going to be, you said there may be as many as 20 vaccines on the market in various places. Do Will we see people like not happy with what they hear from their personal physicians? So they go across state lines and try to find some other place. Can you talk about all of that? please? Sure. So when I said 20, I, but just to be clear, I think 20, like a year, a year and a half from now. Sure. Right? Sure. Uh, but let's say, let's say we're talking about April and vaccines are starting to become more widely available. I would guess, and it's all guesswork, so is that there will be three to five vaccines out in the marketplace by April, three or four. And then the question will be, which one do you get? And uh, I don't think that they will segment them by state. So I don't think it'll be like Pfizer in Rhode Island, but J&J &J in Massachusetts. Like, I don't think, I think there will be some amount of doses of each of these vaccines available everywhere. Um, this is, again, where the federal government is working. Uh, the CDC is working with states to try to come up with a plan. And there's been a lot of kind of confusion about how that's going. And, and we're going to want to see some very clear plans on distribution. We're going to see clear plans on costs. I have been very vocal, both in testimony to Congress and elsewhere, uh, that it should be of uh, zero cost to patients. I just think this is so important that we should not ask people to pay for the vaccine or the visit associated with the vaccine, we should find a way to get that covered, no matter what your insurance, uh, or if you, even if you're missing insurance or lacking insurances, as so many Americans are. Um, so then the question will be, how will you know? And my hope is that we get very clear guidance from the scientists at the CDC, guidance that is then given to doctors and pharmacists. Uh, I have been pushing for pharmacies to be able to give out these vaccines and to administer these vaccines. They can for the flu vaccine. There's no reason to think they can't, but they're going to need guidance. And uh, and that needs to come from the CDC. The CDC is the place that generally gives this kind of guidance. And then you're going to have to see physician groups and nursing groups and pharmacy groups uh, help educate their uh, folks uh, in each of these areas. So if we do our job right, this will this will be OK. But I am worried that there's a lot of complexity here. And by March and April, we may be a lot. There may be a lot of confusion. So all of us are going to have to do some good, clear communication. I'm going to go with a couple of more uh, questions from our audience, and then we'll throw it back to Lori. Uh, here's a question from Lynn says, it sounds like we'll all need to get vaccinated for COVID annually, perhaps, as with the flu vaccine. Why are respiratory viruses particularly volatile or likely to mutate more than, say, the viruses we all receive childhood vaccinations? Yeah, great question. Uh, great question, Lynn. So, so two things on this. So first of all, the reason we need to get a flu vaccine, a different flu vaccine every year, is because the flu vaccine, the, the influenza viruses that circulate do change. There is a lot of what we call antigenic drift. And so the, the flu that you're going to have this fall is not the same influenza virus uh, that we had last fall. And so that's why every year we make a bunch of guesses about which flu strains are likely to show up. And then we vaccinate people against those. And some years we get the guesses perfect and we get a super effective vaccine. And other years we get the guesses a little bit off and the vaccine is less effective. That's not what's going to happen with this. 
I don't expect a whole lot of mutation or antigenic drift with this virus. I expect that the virus we're dealing with now is the same one that was essentially six months ago, and I bet it'll be largely the same a year from now. The, this one, the issue really is about how long does the immunity last? And with coronaviruses in general, we have seen that immunity may not last uh, more than 12 months. My guess, and again, I'm, I'm now into the realm of speculation, that for a year or two, we may need to get it annually, but that we're going to be working so hard on making really high quality vaccines that I bet, and this is a bet, I bet we're going to get to a point where two, three years from now, we may have vaccines that give you long uh, term protection. We don't have quite vaccines like that for, for coronaviruses, so I don't want to over promise here, but I do think people are going to try to make vaccines that are long lasting, but it's not because it's mutating. It's just because we want to make sure the immunity lasts for long enough. Thank you. And we have asked a question to our audience that if a vaccine were to become available, would you get the vaccine? So we'd love to hear the audience thoughts on, on that question. I guess it's a little provocative, but we'll see. I love it. <laughs> what they have to say. Uh, one more question and then we'll go to Lori. Uh, Daxa asks, when the vaccines are available, who should not get vaccinated and what might be some of the side effects? And will each of these vaccines have different side effects? I presume? Yeah, entirely possible that the different vaccines might have different side effects. Um, you know, there are different vaccines. So, so the big questions are things like people who are immunocompromised, should they not get a vaccine? I think we're going to have to figure out, I mean, there's certain vaccines that use uh, viral vectors where you may, be, may, may not want to use those for people who are immunocompromised. Uh, there are other vaccine uh, products that we're developing, uh, for instance, that directly inject uh, genetic material, mRNA, the mRNA-based vaccines. They may be safer. I don't know. And again, I'm not, I don't want to get too far ahead of this, and I hate speculating on these things. But there are going to be really important questions about people who are immunocompromised and how do we protect them. Obviously, the best way to protect them is to keep the virus levels very low and have everybody else vaccinated. That'll help a lot. But there will be these questions, and we're just going to have to do some studies to sort all of that stuff out. So I don't know. Uh, I can make some guesses about what vaccines may not uh, want to be done in which populations, but we'll have to figure that out over the next year. You know, I do expect that the vaccine side effects will vary. And I bet, and I'm going to say something that uh, I, I want to put on the table is I think likely in the first generation of vaccines, uh, some of the more effective ones are going to be really immunogenic. And what I mean by that is what, what, well, what that means is you're going to see a lot of people with a lot of very short term passing side effects. So you, we may very well be, have vaccines where 20, 30, 40% of people will get a fever uh, in, uh, and maybe even a high fever in the first 24 hours. Still quite safe. Those people will get through it. But you know that happens rarely with the flu vaccine. Most people tolerate it incredibly well. I would not be surprised if the first generation of coronavirus vaccines are a bit more difficult, more sore arm, more just feeling lousy for 24 hours. And if that's happening in 30, 40% of the people, and hopefully it won't, uh, but we will, that, that'll be a lot. That'll be pretty serious and people will have to get through it. But I think it'll still be worth it because again, it's gonna be short term, it'll be transitory, maybe helped by taking Tylenol. Uh, but we are gonna see, this is not gonna be super smooth easy. Um, but again, as long as we're doing the science right and it's safe and it's effective, uh, I think we're gonna wanna, um, people are gonna wanna get it. I'm gonna wanna get it. Thank you. We are batting seven for seven right now um, in yeses that people have said they will take the, the vaccine. And one of them, Stephen says, if Dr. Ja says it is safe or Dr. Fauci, I would get it. So a lot of pressure, uh, Doc, but uh, you, you, you will wear that well. NBC Cam says yes, but knowing that every zombie movie starts this way with people getting vaccinated. But BC is still willing to take the vaccine. So thank you, BC. And Daxa thanks you as well for your uh, answer to that. So let's go to Laurie. Thank you, Sri. Um, question about treatment of COVID patients. So we're multiple months into this, obviously, and hundreds of thousands of people have, have died. Question is, are we any more skilled at treating patients who are, in fact, presenting with COVID-19 symptoms? Yes, it's a great question. And uh, the short answer is yes. So let me give you what I mean. If you were infected with this virus on March 1st, 
and ended up in a hospital uh, anywhere in the United States um, versus if you're infected today and end up in a hospital. Your chances of dying today, I think, are somewhere between 30 and 50 percent lower. Uh, that is dramatic improvement. Uh, there's a whole bunch of studies being done to try to, and I've looked at some of the data, so I'm not just making this up, uh, and we'll see that data emerge in the, in the weeks and, and months ahead. Uh, and, and let me tell you why. What are we doing differently today? So uh, in terms of therapies, uh, we have remdesivir, which may or may not be useful. New clinical trial out of WHO last night says maybe it's not so useful. Earlier trials say maybe it's a little useful. Dexamethasone, I, I've, which I've talked about, the steroid, really helpful in people with advanced disease, people with severe disease. And that's obviously the people we care about in terms of saving lives. I also think the biggest issue is that we've just gotten better. Uh, doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and others who take care of the critically ill have just figured out how to get how to treat this disease better than we did in six months ago. Obviously, six months ago, we didn't know anything about this. Like, we're learning this new viral uh, infection. That experience is really paying off. So I do think we've gotten better. Uh, I think we're going to continue to get better. I think these new antibody therapies are going to help a lot. Uh, again, I said I think because the evidence is not all in yet. Uh, and obviously, you know, it might turn out that I'm, I'm wrong, but I am optimistic about the antibody therapies. Uh, I'm frustrated that we don't have more uh, doses of it, by the way. If we had been smart back in March and April as these antibodies were being developed, um, we would have, the, the federal government would have gone to these companies and said, hey, even before you know whether it's going to work or not, make 100 million doses. We'll just pay for it up front. Uh, because if it ends up working, we want to have all those doses for everybody who's getting infected. We didn't do that. And so now these companies have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of doses. But, you know, 50,000 Americans are getting infected a day right now. Uh, we'll, we'll plow through that within a, within a few days. So we really do need to ramp up production. But I think therapies are coming. Uh, what I'd love to get to, which I'm worried that it's going to be really hard, is to a point where if you got infected tomorrow, you could go to a CVS or a Walgreens and uh, and pick up a prescription of an, an antiviral therapy, take it for five days and be at home and know that that's going to dramatically improve your recovery. Those oral therapies are rare. I don't know that we're going to get one anytime super soon. Obviously, I hope and pray that we do, but I don't see anything in the clinical trials that's yet making me optimistic that something like that, which would be a true game changer, is coming. Sri, you're um, coming to us um, from New York, and I'm wondering, Sri and Dr. Ja, what you hear is what what you hear happening in hospitals all across the country when patients come in and they're presenting, and they want the unique cocktail that President Trump uh, received. What um, what are, what are some of the experiences that you've heard from the bedside along those lines? Was that for me or for Shri? That was for me. So I, I imagine there may be some, you know, regional differences. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, us. let me let me start, but I, I'd love to hear if anybody has has a different experience. Um, so, you know, I, I love the president's enthusiasm about about the antibody therapy he received, uh, but his idea that it's going to be available to everybody in America free of charge. As I said, I think what I remember was that Regeneron has about 150,000 or 200,000 doses. If Regeneron gave it to everybody who's infected, it would exhaust their supply in four days. So unfortunately, it's just not available and it hasn't gotten authorized. Uh, and there are lots and lots of people coming in sick, asking for it. There are people who are infected. We think it works best when you do it early before people even are hospitalized. Obviously, the president got it very early in his disease course, and I suspect that's what helped him so much. Uh, we don't have the doses. We don't have the. We don't have this. So most people, if you were to get infected tomorrow, you probably could not get the Regeneron or the Lilly uh, antibodies that the president and Lilly uh, antibodies are the ones that Governor Chris Christie got. Uh, unfortunately, not available for the rest of us right now. Thank you, Doc. I have a question about masks. Since we've been talking a lot about vaccines, let's also talk about masks. And Governor Chris Christie seems to have uh, understood that he was wrong about masks, and he has admitted that right now, now that he's out of the hospital after seven days in the hospital. Please talk about masking and where we are with that, and what can we do with terms in terms of uh, using masks properly? Yeah. I'll tell you where the public health community 
uh, disagrees around mass and where there is no disagreement. So, you know, if you listen to, to Bob Redfield, the president's uh, CDC director, uh, Dr. Redfield says, if everybody wore a mask, uh, we would, for six weeks, we would bring this pandemic to a close. That essentially would just end outbreaks across the country. I think that's a little more optimistic than I am. But, but that is not, but the point is, there is no disagreement among all of us in the public health field that masks are enormously useful. So the big question is, are they like the miracle or are they just awesome? And, you know, I'm kind of in the they're awesome camp and there are people who are like, this is miraculous. But nonetheless, like, here's what we know. Uh, if you think about what happened in Arizona in June, July, Arizona saw some of the highest number of cases in the country in June and July. And then it got turned around. And you know what turned it around? Counties. So the state was blocking counties from putting in and, and enforcing state mandates on, I'm sorry, uh, mandates on mask wearing. And basically, Governor Ducey stopped blocking counties on the mask wearing. And Maricopa County and a couple of the other counties put in uh, mandatory mask laws, and you saw infections plummet. So my my feeling on this is the data on masks is totally clear at this point. People should be wearing masks, when and where. So I'll tell you what I do, and I'm a little bit kind of a bit more obsessive about it, and I'll tell you what I think is reasonable. So I wear a mask pretty much every time I leave my home, except when I'm in my office. So right now I'm in my office, there's nobody else on this entire floor. I don't wear a mask inside my own office because I'm just here by myself. Uh, but basically, anytime I'm outside my home, anytime I'm outside my office, I will wear a mask. If I, you know. And uh, the basic rule is if you're going to be indoors with other people uh, who are not part of your home bubble, you should be wearing a mask. If you're outdoors, um, I just wear a mask kind of out of habit. The truth is that like, sometimes at 11 o'clock at night, I will take my dog out for a walk. I'm not going to see anybody. I probably don't have to wear a mask. I probably I do anyway, but I don't have to. Um, but if you're going to be within eight or 10 feet of other people for anything more than 15, 20 seconds, if you're going to talk to people and within 10 or 12 feet outside, any of those situations, you need to wear a mask. If everybody did that and uh, outdoors most of the time, indoors all the time, except when you're at home or in your office, uh, it would make this enormous difference. It would probably cut the number of cases by 70, 80%. If everybody did it and was really diligent, we could open up most schools in America. Like there's just these massive benefits of wearing high quality masks. So one of the things I've been actually pushing for, and I've been talking to companies is, um, you know, it'd be great because part of the question that people ask is what's a good quality mask? How do I get it? Is I have been pushing for we should we should have some sort of a certification process of what is a good enough high quality mask. And then we should have businesses and, and other leaders uh, pushing for uh, not just mandatory mask laws, but then really trying to normalize it and, and, and get people to do it on an ongoing basis. Because if we did that, uh, obviously, I've been pushing policymakers to do that. I've been pushing public health people to do that. And, and then there's all this stuff, anti-mask stuff that creeps up. It's shocking to me that we are at a point where somehow for people, this feels political. There's nothing really political about it. The virus is very clear. It doesn't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. Um, if we can get everybody to wear masks, it would make an enormous difference. Okay, we have a couple of quick questions for you. Uh, John Love asks, what numbers are being reported regarding uh, the number of cases, positivity rates, mortality rates, so many of them, which one should we pay attention to? Yeah. So I'll tell you where I get almost, I look at about 15 different sources of data every day, but I'll tell you my main source of data, and that's the COVID tracking project. COVID tracking project is a phenomenal, like incredible service. The people who've done this deserve like massive number of prizes. Basically what they do is they go through every state every day, pull data from departments of public health from every state, they have 600 journalists and other volunteers doing this every day. Uh, you know. 10 plus assigned to each state. And COVID tracking, there you go. COVID tracking uh, is incredible. And there are, you could look at a variety of things. There are three numbers, well, there, there are five numbers that I pay attention to, right? Cases, tests, percent positive, hospitalizations, and deaths. 
And if you push me to look at one number and one number only, I would look at trends in percent positive. Percent positives going up means your infection is spreading and your testing is not keeping up with it. So those are the things that I really try to pay very, very close attention to. But I look across all five of them. And I, I begin with cases. And if cases have gone up, my next question is, how are we doing on testing? If testing has gone up a lot and percent positive has fallen, then I feel better. If cases go up, testing has come down and percent positive has gone up a lot, I get very, very worried. And it's not any single day's number, it's really the trend. And here's the key point. If you are gonna wait until hospitalizations start rising, you have waited too long. By the time hospitalizations start rising, certainly by the time deaths start rising, you've got weeks of infections already built in. Because from the day somebody's infected to the day they end up in a hospital is often 10 days. And then from the day somebody's hospitalized to the day they die is typically two to three weeks. So death is a four to five week lagging indicator. You don't wanna see deaths climbing. Uh, you've really waited too long to act. Yeah, thank you, Doc. Uh, Rose Horowitz asks, how, may, how have various companies treating vaccines been ensuring they get a diverse sample? We've been hearing it's especially hard to get black and other minority populations to sign up for clinical trials, as well as older people above 65. Uh, will that hold back FDA approval? Yeah, this is a fabulous question because it's such a hard, it's such an important problem to solve and so hard to solve. Um, so Moderna, one of the first ones out of the gate, has slowed down their trial to try to recruit, not slow down the trial, but just focus their trial a bit more on trying to recruit uh, more uh, black and Latino patients. I think that's really critical. Um, look, we've talked so much about vaccine confidence. And, you know, I, as we all know, and there's an old line that I say over and over again, which is vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations save lives. Um, vaccinations require a vaccine require the whole supply chain and require confidence in the person receiving the vaccine that the vaccine is gonna help them. That last bit is critical. And if we're gonna, and we need to make sure that this is a vaccine where there is high levels of confidence in the African-American community and the Latino community, uh, that's not gonna happen if we test it in a bunch of young, healthy white people and say, hey, works great. We've got to test it across a broad range of populations. So there's a lot of work being done to try to uh, enroll more Black and Latino and, and Asian uh, Americans into these clinical trials. A lot of it is working with community leaders. It's working with uh, trusted uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, but it's not easy. Uh, but I think it's one of the places where all of us have to push in the same direction uh, try to get more diverse crowds into the into the clinical trial, so we'll know uh, more effectively whether it really works or not. Thank you. Here's a nice comment from Cindy Butler, who says that she says thank you for this has been an informative, fact-based, and optimistic session, and we're Good. very grateful to you, Dr. Ja, for for that. Back to you, Lori. Okay, um, let's bring this back to uh, where we started, which is a local conversation, uh, Dr. Ja. Governor Gina Raimondo has been uh, an intrepid and indefatigable leader on this um, COVID-19 response here in Rhode Island. Can you share uh, as to whether you've had uh, conversations with uh, Governor Raimondo and how you feel Rhode Island will be tracking in the next month or so? Yeah, I haven't spoken to the governor directly. I've spoken to various members of her team. I've certainly spoken to Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott, who's our uh, health department. I speak to her uh, with with quite a bit of frequency, and uh, and then I had a piece in the Providence Journal about a month ago about my optimism about Rhode Island for the fall and winter, uh, largely because of what I think has been terrific state leadership. Um, so let's talk about Rhode Island where we are. Um, it, it, Rhode Island is in a difficult situation. I mean, cases have risen quite a bit. Percent of test positives has gone up uh, quite a bit. And the spread is happening in, in many different places. It often starts with young people, and then it, it, then it ends up affecting older people, as we talked about earlier. Um, so what we know is the spread happens in the places we've talked about. Indoor gatherings where people are having house parties and getting together. Uh, they happen in restaurants. And uh, I've been talking to um, 
Uh, I've been talking to restaurants about uh, work that they are doing to try to make restaurants safer. And I do believe indoor dining can be made safe. Um, bars are a real challenge. And there's a fine line between bars and restaurants, but they're, but they're a real challenge and very difficult to pull that off. One of the things I've been pushing for, I've been spending a lot of time with Congress in the last uh, four months, uh, every week probably talking to a large number of members, uh, both sides of the political aisle. Uh, I've been pushing very hard to say, if we're gonna ask restaurants and bars to bear the burden of this pandemic by staying closed or, or staying largely closed, we've got to find a way to support them. We've got to find a way to financially uh, help them get through this because we want them and we'll need them around in the spring and summer as we emerge from this. So uh, there are, I think, ways that we can financially uh, help these organizations, these companies, these businesses, most of them small businesses, people investing their life savings into trying to run these things. Well, there's, there are ways of getting them through it. So those are the kinds of things we need to do I think the governor in general has been very proactive and aggressive, and that's what we need. Uh, the bottom line on this virus is this. Every country that has done well, they have been aggressive and out front. Every country that has done badly has been slow to respond and trying to play catch up. You don't want to play catch up with this virus. Everything you see today is... You are seeing trouble today. The trouble began two to four weeks ago. You want to act now. Uh, that's the lesson of this virus. That's the lesson of from New Zealand, South Korea. Uh, let me just say one last point. What we've seen in country after country is countries that have done a good job controlling the virus, they have had a much more robust economic recovery. Uh, far smaller drops in unemployment, far smaller drops in GDP uh, than countries that have done badly. So it's the old control the virus and the economy can recover. Uh, and the way to do that is being aggressive on those things. And one other additional point that I noticed in terms of those countries that do well is the notion that they're run by women. That, you know, that is that is a truism. Um, there are a couple of male leaders who've done okay, uh, just to stick up uh, for male leaders a little bit, but I'm kidding. The bottom line is, if you look at the countries, when you look at Germany, if you look at New Zealand, uh, there's a bunch of countries that have done superbly well, and they really, there really is a preponderance of uh, women leaders in those countries. So uh, maybe it's just a random coincidence, but I suspect it is not. Sri, I think we have one last uh, comment that you'd like to, uh, to share with us. Um, sure, there's a question about how can we defeat the virus if not everybody gets vaccinated. So maybe a thought about that. And I just want to tell everyone, this has been one of the best hours that I have had the honor of listening to, let alone participating in. Everyone we know needs to watch the recording of this. Please share this right now, tag your friends and family and make them watch this recording because they will learn a lot. And especially with all this bad information going around the internet, this is a accurate, scientifically based, and as we heard, optimistic look at the future. And we're so grateful to Dr. Jha. So over to you, Doc. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, I, so the question of how do we how do we get to safety if not everybody? Everybody doesn't need to get vaccinated, um, but we do probably need to get uh, 70, 80 percent of people vaccinated. And, and that is going to be a challenge. It's going to be hard. Um, I think the way we do this is as I've discussed, try to be sympathetic to people who are skeptical, try to understand what their concerns are and meet them where they are. I think a vast majority of Americans will ultimately wanna be vaccinated uh, to keep themselves safe and keep their families and their communities safe. And there'll be a small proportion who are not, and that's okay. Uh, we don't need everybody, but we need most people on board. And I think we get there with science. I think we get there with open communication. I think we get there with humility. Uh, and kindness. And if we do all of those things, I think we can get through this and be at a very different and a much better place uh, sometime next year. That is a very optimistic uh, conclusion to our discussion. I'd like to thank my co-host, Sri Srinivasan, founder and CEO of DigiMentors, uh, for once again joining me in this very important discussion. Sri and I have uh, teamed up on multiple occasions when we have uh, very special guests so that we can share multiple perspectives. So, Sri, thank you so much, as always. 
And uh, Dr. Ja, uh, we are at the top of the hour, so I know you have uh, other obligations. But before I let you go, I just want to just ask you, how are you? How's your family? How are you doing? And what can we do to continue to be partners with you? Oh, well, thank you. I, I, I'm well, uh, a little tired, as I think we all are at this point in the pandemic. Uh, everybody is hanging in on the family front. Uh, I do have it. That word is I've started going out on walks with uh, students and staff and faculty uh, at, at Brown and discovering different neighborhoods of Providence and uh, discovering the incredible art on uh, that uh, is publicly displayed in the city. Um, that's a huge bonus. I, I love that about Providence. So there's a lot of great things that I am learning, but I hope we can stay in touch and, and, and continue to engage because let's be very clear. This is not a pandemic where, oh, we have a problem, the government's going to fix it. This really does require leadership from civil society, from universities, from businesses, from chambers of commerce, from, from government, from everybody else. And so if there are ways that we can partner to push out good science, uh, get the virus under control, help our economy recover, I'd love to think about what those partnership opportunities are. I think there are many. And if we can do to work together, we will be stronger for it. So I look forward to that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ja. We're seeing so many comments coming in from folks that are really very, very, um, very optimistic. It feels so much better. There's a sense of relief uh, based on the things that you have shared with us today. So Carmen says, this has been so helpful. Neil says, this has been very, very informative. So many people watching from all across uh, the state. Thank you so much for your insight into these discussions. Thank you, everyone. This has been so informative. So you can see that there has been uh, a common theme of uh, people who are really enjoy listening to this and learning from this. And uh, we're all learning together, right? Yes. So uh, uh, straightforward approach and frank delivery of the information, he says. Thank Dan. you. So, um, can't ask for more than that. Steven says, this is great. We love having Dr. Ja in Rhode Island. Uh, so I will say that that's actually unbelievably true. We look forward to uh, seeing more of you around the streets of Brown University. Patrick is saying, um, thank you, Dr. Ja and the chamber. So yeah, uh, Brown University and the School of Public Health are very longstanding and strong members of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. So I know that uh, we will be seeing more of you. Um, I look forward to it. Thank you very much. And, you know, lots of, you know, lots of great feedback. So, um, Dr. Ja, thank you again. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on uh, CNN and CBS and New York Times and MSNBC and NPR and all the places uh, where we tune in and you can see what you're thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. And not the least of which is your Twitter feed, which is based on science. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye.